So today is giving first fruits. So we'll talk about what that really means. In the last few years, people have made millions of dollars by investing their money in the stock market. Some of you may participate in it and you know that there are lots of ups and downs. Overnight, those who have chosen wisely, their stock has reaped a fortune. On the other hand, in March of 2019, Bill Gates lost $112 million in one day and slipped to the second place as the world's richest man. Bezos had him beat. You know, he is the uh, founder of Amazon. He had him beat by a few million at that point in time. But to us, we just don't even understand what that means when they're speaking in those terms because most of us don't have the facility to even uh, invest in those kind of numbers. What would happen if the stock market lost half its value in one day? And I think about those things because I am in retirement age and we have invested our whole life as we've been taught, right? We've been taught, put some money in your savings, invest wisely so that you'll have money for retirement. And you know, all the portfolio investors out there tell you to diversify, have some in stocks and bonds and you know, to diversify your portfolio. So when we think about that, if the stock market lost half its value in one day, we would be devastated, some of us. And I have, I can, we can raise our hand because lots of us have experienced this over the last 20 years where the stock market has dropped and we might have lost a half or a third of our investments just overnight. And then you have to wait years for it to climb back up to get you back to where you were to begin with if you're fortunate enough to do that. But the things of this world are really very much like this bubble that grows rapidly and then in a moment, it's gone. Additionally, personal debt is at an all-time high. I am so shocked. I shouldn't be, but it's probably different than the way I operate my household. But I am so shocked when people tell me how much debt they have in credit card. People have large amounts of money in credit card debt. Some can't help it because they just put their daily living on there because they don't even make enough to make ends meet. But there are so many people who see that as just a place to charge it. If you want it and you don't have it, you can charge it and then you can pay it back little by little. But what you never realize is you rarely ever get a chance to pay it off when you're in that mindset because most of the interest rates on credit cards are ranged between 16 and 24%, which if it compounds, the amount just continues to grow and you whistle, chip, whittle away at a little by little by paying the minimum amount each month. So many never get out of debt. Many people are still in debt. Many people have debt on their credit card that things they purchased 10 years ago. So yes, it is something very serious when we talk about personal debt. And unfortunately, we're not talking about personal debt from buying your home. That in itself is its own thing. This is just everyday living expenses or things that people want that they want to buy and they put on a credit card. It just seems that we are in a world of worry. We worry about money no matter how much you have. If you have too little money, you're thinking about what can I get and where is the money coming from? If you have lots of money, you're thinking about what can I buy and how do I invest so that I don't lose all my money? So there's always worry about money. People think people with lots of money don't have any worries, but they worry, let me tell you, because I know quite a few. You worry about money no matter what, too little or too much. But where can we actually go to find financial security for the present and the future? Where is the financial security for us today? God never intended that you and I would worry about money, ever. Jesus invites us to trust him with our daily needs. We should come to him with all our daily needs. We don't need to rely on a credit card or a family member or a bank for our daily needs. But the fact is, most of us don't trust God. And worse, because we don't trust him, 
how many may actually be stealing from him? Ooh, those are chilling words. Come on, now you say, nobody would steal or embezzle money from God. At least if you had any sense, you wouldn't do that. But God's shocking message in Malachi 3, 8 says, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Boy, that's chilling. I know that's been brought up probably in every single sermon and message you've heard about tithing, is that you cannot rob God of his own money. God owns everything. And when he asks you just to return the 10% that he already owns, and you keep it, you are robbing God. That's a serious thing to say, but it's even more serious if you're not doing it. You don't want to be robbing God of, God of his tithes and offerings. And amazing as it may seem, many have used that stolen money from God and subsidized their own overspending. You see that 10% you keep from God, you're using it for other things, and guess what? It just goes out the window somewhere. You spend it on something and you can't even remember. And that was God's money to grow his kingdom. And yet you didn't think about it or you forgot. You forgot to pay your tithes and you just let the week on, go by. And then you use that money on something else and now it's gone. You see, you have to pay attention and show God that he comes first. I don't think a lot of people rob God on purpose. I don't think they purposely say, I'm going to keep this 10% and I'm going to spend this money on me. I don't think people do that. I think people don't realize when they don't give that 10% back to God that they are robbing God. So people simply just either don't know God's word or they don't focus on it. Therefore, they don't trust him. So Malachi 6, 31 says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Malachi 6, 32 says, For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. We worry and fret so much when if we only obeyed God and trusted him, our lives would be so much better off. We'd be more happy and content and not frustrated, not over-anxious. We would be able to trust in the God who has promised us that he will look out for us. The stock market doesn't offer risk-free investments. We know that. Banks offer almost no interest to hold your money, and we know that as well. But God promise us, promises us a way to make our investments with guaranteed returns. Our money is only sure when we invest it in God's work with tithes and offerings. That's how we invest it in his work for his kingdom. First of all, how can God make such a guaranteed commitment to us on our investments? Because God created the earth and all the resources, including us. As we see in Psalm 24, 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's, and all it's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So everything in the world, including us, is owned by God. We have to remember that. If it's something you need to remember every day when you open your eyes and you wake up, you should have that thought in front of you. Maybe you should have this Bible verse in front of you to remind you everything in this world belongs to God. From the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, the breath that you take while you are sleeping and you're not even aware and you're breathing while you're sleeping, God allows all of that. And so we should wake up very grateful every morning. Thank you, Lord, for letting me wake up this morning. Thank you for the breath. Allow me to do your will today, right? Those are the things that we should be saying every morning and showing our gratefulness and our thankfulness. And God will bless us throughout the day as we continue to be faithful. Psalm 50, verses 10 through 12 says, God owns the world and everything in it. He simply permits people to use it. He allows us to have the riches that we do or the meager amounts that we have. 
He allows that. He also gives the wisdom and the power to prosper and to accumulate wealth, as he says in Deuteronomy 8, 18. It is not for your selfish purposes, but to further his kingdom. He also gives us wisdom and power to prosper and accumulate wealth. In Deuteronomy 8.18, often people believe that they work hard and they deserve every single penny they make, never realizing without God, they wouldn't even be able to have the wisdom and the power to prosper and gain the money to begin with. You have to think about that because we always feel like we're self-sufficient and it is because, especially in this world today, it's the all about me world and people think it's me, I worked hard, I made this money, I should decide how to spend it, when those eyes should be taken out. It is all about God. It is God's money. It is God's resources. It is God's wisdom that he puts in our brains that allow us to make money. And he just says, remember me, give me back a tenth, show me how important I am. Give me back a tenth so I can use it to grow my kingdom. We live in a society that has almost forgotten that all our blessings come directly from God. It is so easy to forget it in the hustle and bustle and busyness of our days. Boy, doesn't Satan keep us busy. The minute we think we're going to have time to relax, something always crops up and steals our attention away, doesn't it? We're thinking, oh, we're going to have a nice relaxing afternoon, and it never comes. Something will crop up, and Satan is just going to keep us so busy and distracted that we can't focus on what God is doing for us. We feel we did it, we deserve it, but it was actually through the power of God in our lives that allows these things to happen. In return for blessing us with an abundant life filled with blessings, all God asks is that we return to him 10% of all we gain. God doesn't need our money. God's not sitting up there saying, okay, come on, come on, give me my 10%, I need it. God does not need that money. God's kingdom will flourish. God needs you to show him that you are committed to putting him first. You see, many people go out and pay all their bills, and then whatever is left, if I have enough left, I'll give some of that to God in my tithe. And we think we're doing God a favor. But you have to realize, no, 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 no. If God is first in your life, your 10% comes out first. What remains will allow you to pay your bills because if you put God first, he will bless you. There have been numerous, numerous stories and testimonies shared across all churches in America where people have mentioned that they paid their tithe not even knowing how they would have food or how they'd be able to pay their electricity bill. And yet because of their faithfulness, God made it happen. An unexpected friend delivered some food an unexpected piece of mail comes in the mail and it has a check in it. There are ways that God can provide. But if you don't trust him and you don't believe him and you don't put him first, those things will not occur on his behalf because he says, you be faithful to me and I will bless you. So I can't think of another reason why we should do that. We need to remember where our blessings come from. The word tithe literally means one-tenth. So tithe is 10% of our increase, and it is, again, to be taken off the top, not the bottom, after the bills are paid. God calls it first fruits, and he wants us to return one-tenth to him as our acknowledgement of our thankfulness our love, and our gratitude towards him. So, one-tenth of every dollar we earn or are given to us as a gift actually belongs to God. So we will never forget our creator. It's simple math, and it's not difficult. It's really not difficult to figure out a tenth. I know some people probably struggle in math, 
But a tenth is pretty easy. You just move the decimal point one space over and you've got your tenth. So it's not too complicated. And I think God made it in a way so that it would be easy for us to figure out. Again, he only asks for 10%. And he's more than fair to us because we have the other 90% to use however we feel we need to. So we do have freedom to spend the other 90% that God gave us. It was God's money to begin with. And he says, you use the 90% in the ways you see fit in your household, but remember to give me the 10% so that I can grow my kingdom. Especially when we realize that everything belongs to the Lord. In Haggai 2, 8, it says, all the silver and gold in the world belongs to the Lord. When we get right down to it, nothing belongs to us. Nothing. We think there are possessions because we paid money and bought them, but they all belong to God. Even the things that we bought belong to God. Everything in this world belongs to God. God said in Leviticus 2730, all the tithe in the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. It belongs to God and we cannot keep it for ourselves, no matter how much we want to keep it. And I will tell you, in a day and age where we saw businesses close and people lose their jobs, money got tight, didn't it? For several people, they had to rethink how they were spending. And it's amazing that people survived. People survived and cut back on their spending, which tells you, you probably could live a little more frugally. <laughs> Most of us live too comfortably when some of that extra comfort can be shifted to helping grow God's kingdom, especially in a time in the United States as we get closer to the end of times, more people need to hear the message. We need more money and time and resources focused on growing God's kingdom. So this is a time to reflect and look at how your spending has gone and whether or not you're paying your tenth to God. Now, the tenth is the tithe, and we're going to get into an offering because we call it tithes and offerings. We kind of lump it together, and people think, well, that 10% covers it all, but it doesn't, and we're going to define that for you just so you understand what God's Word says. According to God, the tithe was to be given first, and it was the best of our increase. You remember everything that was brought to God was the best, right? The lambs that were brought were the best. You know, you had to bring the purest and the best to God. So your 10% should be the best. It should come right off the top. Numbers 18.12 says, All the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine, and the grain, the first fruits which they offer to the Lord, I have given them to you. When we tithe, we aren't giving God a gift. See, some people think that tithe is a gift to God. It's not a gift. One-tenth of all we receive already belonged to him. It was his to begin with. You're just giving it back to him to use to grow his kingdom and to show your faithfulness in trusting God. When organized religion was originated by God in the wilderness sanctuary, the tribe of Levi was given the responsibility of ministering to the people through the sanctuary service. The Levites did not receive an inheritance when the land of Canaan was divided among the 12 tribes. Instead, they were to live from the tithe and offering brought to God by the people. In the New Testament times, and even to this day, God intends that ministers of the gospel should live from the tithe brought to God by his people. The tithe is the means that God intended to pay for helping evangelize the world. 
See, God knew that his kingdom needed to grow, that we needed people sharing his word, and that that would require resources, whether it be the feeding of people or helping to minister to people financially, our missionaries that go around the world. Those people have to be funded to be able to live. And they live meagerly. They're not living the high life while they're out there doing this. But somebody has to pay for that. So we have to evangelize the world. And this tent that we give back to the church helps to pay for those types of missions and missionaries. What example did Jesus give to his disciples of caring for his resources. In John 6, 12, we read, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he gave us an example. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is wasted. We are to take good care of all that is God's. God gives in abundance, and he takes what we offer and multiplies its effectiveness. And we've gotten to see that throughout the Bible. Jesus taught that we should be faithful stewards of all his goods. He indicates that if we waste what he gives us, we will be removed from the position of steward. In other words, he will withhold his blessings from us. In Luke 16, 1 and 2, Jesus told a story. There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. Does God expect his people to be just as faithful in paying our taxes to the government? That's an interesting question. Matthew twenty two twenty one. Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. We read that again in Matthew twenty two twenty one. Many of you have probably heard this. And this is related to Jesus teaching us fiscal responsibility in our dealings with men and God. Whatever we owe, he expects us to pay. Many people may dislike the IRS and don't want to pay taxes, but without a national system of taxation, we'd have no highways, bridges, electricity, heating and air conditioning capabilities, airports, national parks. There's a long list of things that our national money helps to fund that we all enjoy. We all contribute to a great nation, and this was part of God's plan. You always know that when you pool resources, you can do more with those pooled resources than everyone individually trying to do their own thing. What if... I disagree and simply believe that I have to pay 10% tithe just because the church says that I should pay it. Well, Malachi 3.8 says, will a man rob God? Not paying the tithe is a serious problem in our spiritual lives and our walk with God. And the text continues, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? in tithes and offerings. That's pretty straightforward. He's calling it robbery when you don't pay your tithes and offerings. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. If you want to be certain of a prosperous life, pay your tithes. God promises. Matthew, uh, Malachi 3.11, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, 
nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, God will take care of his tithe-paying people. He will make sure that you will have food and clothing and shelter. Because if you are a tithe-paying person and your heart is in it for the right reason, and that's to give back to God what's his and to help him grow his kingdom, you will be blessed. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We bring our needs to him, and he answers us, and gives us whatever is best for our lives and for our salvation. King David wrote this, and it's a verse that I have become very much in love with is a verse in the Bible, Psalm 37, 25. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. In other words, God always takes care of his people. We can count on him. And if you've been in the church most of your life, you've seen this. You've seen people who have come in and been hungry or poor or uh, not as fortunate as us. And you've seen God bless them because they've been faithful and true. And, and it, you can live it out. You can see it all around you. And that is the great news about God's word. It cannot be wrong. And, and it is true that we do not see God ever forsake the righteous. What did Abraham believe about the tithe? You will remember the story of Abraham's nephew, Lot, who was captured from Sodom and carried off into captivity. Abraham took a small army of 300 men and rescued Lot and all the people and their goods that they had been taken by the enemies. Abraham then gave Melchizedek, king and high priest of Salem, a tithe of all the increase of goods that they had captured. Genesis 14 19 and 20, Melchizedek says, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands, and he, Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. So Abraham believed in tithing. In returning tithe to God, Abraham acknowledged God's goodness. He recognized that the increase that he was able to capture came directly from God. If God had not coordinated all the things to have happened, then he would not have received that. But being a faithful man, he trusted God. And then when he got his increase, he didn't run off and say, Yay, I got all this good stuff, I got gold, I got whatever they captured. He didn't run off and use it for himself. He didn't keep it for himself. He immediately went and paid the tithe. He knew that 10% of that was due to God for him blessing him and taking care of him through all that has occurred. So we have to believe that if we paid the tithe, God will bless us because he knows that we are paying the tithe as a recognition of us giving back to God what belongs to him and the fact that we are faithful, that he will take care of us. This 10% is not going to keep you out of the poorhouse. It's not going to keep you from being rich. The 10% is not a large amount. And that's why God says, hey, show me that you trust me. Give me back the 10% so I can continue to use it for growing my kingdom. We acknowledge God's goodness. What did Jacob believe about the tithe? Genesis 28, 22 says, And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, this was the Old Testament. Many people believe that we no longer have to do anything instructed in the Old Testament. We are living in New Testament times. So many people believe that. They've discounted the Old Testament, not realizing the Old Testament is tied to the New Testament in every possible way. It's a story from beginning to end. You don't start in the middle of a storybook and start reading it and think you understand the whole story. You have to start at the beginning. 
The Old Testament is as important, if not more important, to teach you how you should be living today. Did Jesus support the returning of tithe to God when he came during New Testament times? Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So he knew tithe needed to be paid, but he said, don't go around paying your tithe and then treat people badly. Don't not show mercy and love and, and faith. And God says you can't do one with the other, the, out the other. You have to do both. If you truly love God, you won't treat people badly. And if you truly love God, you won't hold back the tithe. They go hand in hand. He was making a point that it's not enough just to obey the letter of the law, which some of us get tangled up in this world with. We must also keep the spirit of the law by being merciful and fair to people. But in speaking so, he said that the tithing principle should be followed. It should not be left undone. Therefore, tithing was just as important in the New Testament as it was in the Old Testament. Again, you find that in Matthew 23, 23. Let's visit this question for a moment. What is the tithe actually to be used for? Behold, I have given the children of Levi all of the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting. That's in Numbers 18.21. The tribe of Levi received no land, for this was how they were to live. They were to have no other job. Their full-time work was in the tabernacle and ministering spiritually to people. What about the New Testament? Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the temple eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. So even today, God intends that ministers of the gospel should live from the gifts brought to God by his people. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is unique in that all our pastors and workers are paid by the conference, the union, the North American division, and in the general conference. Members pay their tithe to the local church, who then sends it to the conference. The conference keeps a percent of that, and then they send it on to the union. The union keeps a percent, and they send it on to the North American Division, and the North American Division keeps a percent and sends it to the General Conference. The church takes in about $2.2 billion each year. All ministers are paid the same salary, regardless of the size of their congregation. Now, that seems a bit odd, doesn't it? In today's world, especially if you look outside our doors at other churches, However, sometimes in more expensive cities, they do receive a larger salary. Ministers are given a housing and car allowance to help them because in larger cities, it does cost more to live there. None of the Adventist ministers will have extravagant homes or be wealthy as compared to many ministers in several of the large churches, especially in America. This is because most congregations hire their own ministers and pay them out of their own pockets locally. They can hire and fire their ministers. In the Adventist system, ministers are placed with the church. There are pros and cons to both systems. I came out of a Presbyterian church, and it was a huge church. We had 6,000 members, and it is true. All the money they took in locally was used to pay for everything that ran the church locally, and they could grow things. They certainly could participate in international missions. But you could see that pastors there were paid pretty well compared to Adventist pastors. 
So it makes me feel like the pastors in this church are certainly not in it for the money. And nor should they be, should they? They should be working for God. They're not working for monetary things on this earth because they realize that their rewards and treasures are in heaven. Although they are still having to live on this earth and are paid so that they can live comfortably, they are not going to be, as we see in other churches, living in large extravagant homes with uh, multiple cars, etc. No minister of the Adventist church decides to become a pastor because he will receive lots of worldly wealth. Just the opposite. He can be assured that he will live comfortably, but never become so rich as to have an ostentatious mansion home. He is God's servant for life. I often think about this as well. I think when you have a large congregation and you know they feed you, basically pay your salary, you're going to probably cater your messages to things that they might want to hear. You're going to keep them very positive. You're not going to want to tell people things they don't want to hear that will make them mad and make them want to leave the congregation. You see, when you don't have that barrier and you're part of this church, you realize the truth is spoken. Like it or not, it comes from God's word and it will always be spoken as truth. We don't have to hide behind messages that are uncomfortable because we know that we can speak them freely and it won't impact my salary if I'm a pastor in the church because I'm serving God. I'm not serving man. And it's not to say other pastors don't in other churches, but I will tell you that you will always remember where the money comes from that feeds your pocket if you're standing in front of people who are helping contribute to that in a big way. What about God's house in comparison to our own? Now, this is going to hit home a little bit. Here's where I believe that we might fail a bit. If we study Haggai 1, 8, 9, we find a message from God about his church buildings. Go up in the mountain and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see... It turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy in your own house. God expects us to care for his house as much as we care for our own homes. Ooh, that one hits home a little bit, doesn't it? If we neglect God's house in favor of our own homes, the blessings of God will not rest on it or on us. We must be careful not to let our priorities with job, home, vacations, and leisure activities rank higher than the importance of God and doing God's work. What about helping the needy? Are we to give offerings to those who are suffering? For the saints of Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. Romans 15, 26 says, So yes, we are to help our brothers and sisters in need. Also, we're told in Acts 2, 44 and 45, and all those who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. This was the spirit of the early New Testament church. However, God does not expect us to liquidate our entire estate, all our holdings, and all our possessions. The New Testament believers still owned homes, and they had means to live from, but they did not live in extravagance and excess. God intended us to take care of the less fortunate. I'm grateful I'm part of a church that does that in many ways. We, there's always more to do but we do supply meals for the homeless. And we have several ministries that reach out to the community for the less fortunate. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to do because we all have excess. 
I can't imagine anyone that is listening to this that cannot point out some excess that they have, right? We do. I'm always looking for places to give away my things, and it's hard. I'm shocked at how hard it is today to try to even give away things uh, because we have so much abundance everywhere. And in several places, even the homeless have more food than they could possibly eat. We were doing the sandwich ministry, feeding thousands. And we were being turned down little by little. They said, no, we've got plenty of food. They don't need it. Because so many churches in the Charlotte area contribute. So we do have a, a very fortunate city in that we are able to provide quite a bit for those who are less fortunate. But there's more to do around the world, as we know. They sold what they did in those days. They did not need it. And they provided a fund for other believers who had a greater need than their own. I believe this is what Jesus would do if he were living on the earth today. It is, a te it is very tempting, especially if you have material wealth, to cut yourselves off from one another, each taking care of your own interests, each providing for and enjoying your own little piece of the world. But as part of God's spiritual family, it is our responsibility to help each other in every possible way. We are fortunate that we have a very giving church, as I mentioned. When we ask for donations, they bubble over. We end up with more people wanting to give and do and help. We recognize that we are very blessed, and yet we use our resources to help bless other people. And if more people did that, we probably could take a chunk out of the homeless population if more people would help those who were less fortunate. How can we determine how much offering to give? 1 Corinthians 16, 2 has some advice. We are told on the first day of the week, lay by him in store. So set aside a sum of money. As God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So basically save it up so that when I come, a collection does not have to be made. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. In other words, plan ahead to give. Start early in the week planning ahead so by the time we come around to Sabbath, you already have your offering. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Deuteronomy 16, 1. So the way God has taken care of you ought to be the way you should want to help take care of God's people. God is very specific about the tithe. One-tenth of all our increase belongs to him. But offerings are in addition to tithes. They can be based on your personal conviction or a ministry that you have a special passion for that you want to support. Or they can be based on monetary blessings God gives. So we have a tithe envelope in our pews. And there are many opportunities to give offerings. You can see at the very top of the tithe envelope, it says tithe 10%. Below that are several opportunities for you to give an offering. If you want to give an offering locally to a local, perhaps, mission that we have or a local uh, event that we have, you can. We're trying currently to raise money to put air conditioning over in our school. In the gymnasium, the school air conditioning has is, is been there since 73, and it is now no longer working. We have a place, if you go online to our Adventist Giving app, where you can give money to that. That would be an offering. That's in addition to your tithe. There are many places on there where to do worldwide offering and evangelism, national offering, local offering. So there's many, many opportunities for offerings. Should giving tithes and offerings be done in a public way to bring attention to the giver? Well, Matthew 6, verse 1, 3, and 4 tells us, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Matthew 6, 1. Boy, that's pretty scary, right? You give your offering, you think you're doing the right thing, but then you go around and tell people about it. It's nullified, it's taken away because you're not doing it for the right reason. God knows your motives. Giving enables us to have a deep satisfaction of advancing God's kingdom. God always knows your heart and your motives. 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's Matthew 6, 3 and 4. With what spirit should we give? 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Many of you know this one. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God also tells us in Psalms 96, 8, bring an offering and come into his courts. Ties and offerings are God's idea, not man's. I once heard a man say, I hate to go to church because they're always asking for money. If we did what God told us, there would be no need to even bring up the topic of money because you would be so blessed by doing what God has already asked you to do. And we're told in Proverbs 11.25 that the person who is generous will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Proverbs 11.25. All you have to do is give, and you will feel this overwhelming goodness inside your heart and soul. And that is a blessing from God. That is your reward from God for being faithful and true and doing what is right. We simply can't lose anything by being generous to others because God always blesses us. Not all blessings bring increase in material possessions. Some are of a spiritual nature. So it doesn't mean if I give money, I'm going to get money back from God as a blessing. That is not what God is saying at all. And some people believe that. If I pay my tithes, I'm going to get a check in the mail and it's going to surprise me and that's going to be a thank, from, thank you from God. That does not happen. That shouldn't be happening and that won't be coming from God because you're giving for the wrong reason. If you give faithfully and say, God, it's your money, I'm giving it back, please use it to grow your kingdom. Use it to evangelize this world. You will be surprised at how God will reward you. And again, sometimes it's of a spiritual nature. However, God promises to provide for our physical needs when we are faithful to him. John wrote, 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. The Bible says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Luke 12, 34. Our hearts follow our investments. If my focus is on accumulating more money, my heart becomes, becomes grasping and proud. But if my focus is on sharing and helping others and blessing God's work, then my heart becomes caring, loving, and humble. Covetousness is one of the 20 terrible sins of the last days that will shut people out of heaven. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. You can read that later when you get home. But you have to be careful of this covetousness. Jesus also told a fearful parable about gaining wealth and living in ease. Luke 12, 19, 20, Jesus' story said, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This is the attitude I've saved every penny so that we can have a great retirement. We can travel. We can go around the world. We can have fun. We can finally enjoy ourselves. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Who gets all the stuff you carefully hoarded instead of sharing them with God's work and God's family? So you have to be careful. There's a fine line for, between saving and protecting yourself for retirement. God doesn't say not to be a good manager of your funds and prepare yourself for your future. He doesn't say be foolish in those things and give every penny up to the kingdom. He says, be careful that you don't spend so much of your time worrying about your retirement or worrying about a fund that you're saving money in because you could be gone tomorrow. We've seen this during COVID, have we not? Many people that probably passed away from COVID probably were saving up for something. 
Maybe their retirement that they never got to use. It's sad, but God says you don't know when your soul is going to be required from you. So how are you doing with all these material possessions? How are you doing with this overabundance? Are you providing some of that to God in the form of offerings? Not your 10% tithe, but offerings. Your abundance. Are you giving that abundance to the church to be used? That is a question because, again, none of us know the night that our soul will be required. How can we be selfish when we consider what Jesus did for us on the cross? That he paid a ransom for us to buy our freedom from Satan and his blood. It seems impossible to be stingy with his work on earth. We are his hands and his feet. We are his witnesses. If you don't have money to give, you can give time. You can give of your resources. There are so many ways you can give to continue God's work. We are always in his church as we grow. We are always looking for people to help us. There are some of us that volunteer for everything, and there are several that don't ever volunteer. There could be more opportunities for you to volunteer time to help move forward God's kingdom. There are resources that we need. We need more people in our media center there to, to help broadcast this and all the platforms that we do. We need people in so many of our ministries. And if you have a ministry that you'd like to start, I'm sure there will be others in the church that would like to join in. So God says, pay attention to how you're spending your time and your money because you don't know when that's going to be the last day for you and what will all that stored up money be doing good for? You see, we leave it behind, don't we? The Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, 15 through 18, that we are either slaves to Satan because of sin or slaves of Jesus through obedience. We sure don't want to be living the life of a slave to sin when Jesus returns. How can we possibly turn our backs on Jesus knowing what he did for us? Offering ourselves and all that we have to Jesus is a natural and logical outcome of loving him. Look how willing we are to do anything for those we love. You think of your loved ones, you think of family members, you think of dear friends. You would do anything for them. I know many people have even used those words. Are you feeling the exact same way for God? Are you feeling that you would do anything for him? No matter what was required. The same attitude we have to present is the way that we show we love God. When we love God, Matthew 6, says that we will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added to you. The real issue today is where is our affections? Is it in the material world? Is it in the worldly things? Is it in our home, our car, our job, our family? <laughs> How much affection is left for God? Shouldn't God be first on that list? And then he blesses all those other things in our life. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Are we willing to exchange heaven in order to hold on to every penny that we have and all our savings and our investments? Or will we obey God and give him what he commands? We are stewards of the money God gives us. Everything on this earth is his. He claims it as his own. Even one-tenth of our income belongs to God, and he's just asking you to return it to him. And don't rob him of that. And we are faithful servants, and we should with the gladness in our heart and the joy in our heart give back to God what is his, knowing it'll be used to evangelize and grow his kingdom and teach his word in places that they cannot hear it. Will we rob God is the question. 
we will make a covenant with God to be a faithful steward of all that belongs to him, including the tenth tithe of our income, and then plan for a regular offering for the ministry of his gospel to the world. Will, we want our life with our Savior and our Lord to be blessed forever. And in doing so, God will pour out the blessings. You just wait and see. And he does tell you to test him on this. So we want to make sure that we understand that everything is God's. We return to him a tenth. We apply offerings with our abundance that we have. And God will continue to bless us in doing so.